Hi everybody, welcome to Adorama TV. I'm Mark Wallace here with Doug McKinley and we are in the Royal, well, tell me the name of this pub. We're in the Trafalgar pub in the Royal Borough of Greenwich in London. Trafalgar pub, it's pretty spectacular. We just had lunch. Well, we are here to talk about the differences in the style of our travels and uh, tell us a little bit about your, your history of travel. Well, I started out as a young photojournalist many, many moons ago and uh, I continue to, to still work that way. Um, my kind of travel nowadays is I do a lot of travel stuff for a lot of newspapers and magazines. So a lot of what I do is kind of taken care of for me. I don't have to worry about hotels, flights, etc., ground transportation, which is very unlike the way you're traveling. Yeah, so I've been to uh, 40-something countries now around the world, um, but I'm doing, originally I did two years on planes, trains, tuk-tuks, uh, you know, boats, all of that stuff. And now for the last year, I've been on a motorcycle by myself. And so it's... Uh, it's liberating because I can go anywhere I want, whenever I want, for the most part, but it's very restrictive because everything I have has to fit on a motorcycle. What's, what's it like? like what's, the, what's the sort of logistical problems you run into with a motorbike? Well, um, a few things because the, you can only have so much weight, not really for any legal reasons, but because it's a motorcycle. You, you don't want to really be weighed down. So weight is a big consideration. And then also uh, you want to be small, inconspicuous, and uh, so size also matters. And so I'm looking for gear that I can fit in a very, very small bag mm -hmm. that doesn't look like it's really expensive. So people are gonna come and steal that. And then also I wanna make sure that um, I can uh, lock it down because I'm by myself. So if I'm going through a border, one of the big challenges is, okay, I have to leave the bike alone mm -hmm. and then go in and get my visa and all that kind of stuff. Wow. And so I can't have anything that's not locked down. So wow. it's, um, that's the challenge, yeah. I'm very different, especially the last, this last 10 years. I usually have a fixer who does everything for me. It gets to the point where I'm so spoiled that I can't do anything for myself. <laughs> um, it becomes freeing, but at the same time, it can be a little bit cumbersome as well. I'd actually like to spend a bit of time traveling the way you do. Yeah. What's the one thing that you'd advise people to bring with you? Um, you know, you can bring anything. Of course, bug spray, malarial tablets, if you're in that kind of thing. Uh, pills for diarrhea, <laughs> very important. <laughs> I mean, just the things that your mom would say, you know, don't forget this. Uh, other than that, it really depends on how you want to travel and what you want to accomplish. So mm -hmm. if you're shooting for a news organization, obviously you're gonna to have to have your gear because that's why you're going. Mm -hmm. If you're going um, with your family on a vacation and that's the point, then I would suggest not bringing a bunch of camera gear, bring an iPhone or a small point and shoot camera mm -hmm. and enjoy the time with your family right. because that should be the focus. So, um, you know, if you're looking at what camera should I buy to go traveling with, mm -hmm. first ask, what do I want to do with those pictures? Of course. Are they family pictures? Are they news pictures? Are they scenic photos? Right. What is it? And that really will determine what you bring. Okay, interesting. Um, as I said before, um, everything's more or less taken care of uh, for me, and I work off of assignment. So what I have to do is, if I'm going to a certain part of the world, it's very uh, seasonal specific. So if I'm gonna work in the Arctic, I'm gonna bring a lot of Arctic clothing with me. If I'm going to work in a tropics, well, it's down to shorts and t-shirts. Um, so in that regard, because it's short and sweet, and I'm going out really quickly and coming back really quickly, I can really focus in what I'm going to bring with me. But with you, you're traveling long distances. You have right. to sort of work for the for uh, work against things like uh, the rainy season or the hot season. Yeah. So you have to vary your your. So uh, I have building. a kit that works for almost any climate. Um, because climates change for me radically and right. really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I was in Lima and then went to Cusco and there's a massive difference in elevation. So I went from nice and, you know, not hot, but okay, to really, really cold, right. uh, sub-freezing temperatures in the Andes and then down into the city. I was just in Nairobi, not even two weeks ago, I think, where it's summer mm -hmm. and uh, shipped the bike from Nairobi here to London. Where it's, it's not summer. Where it's winter. <laughs> And everything I have with me, I brought with me from Nairobi. So I have uh, uh, some coats that they shrink down into really, really small packages okay. and they can fit in my panniers. Right. Um, I've got a big waterproof duffel bag. And so really what I do is I take my winter gear and I stuff it in there right. when I'm in a hot climate. And then uh, the opposite is true when I'm in a cold climate, I bring it out. But I have also things like a three liter camelback, which is a, you know, so I can drink water sure. while I'm riding. I don't need that when I'm in London or zipping through uh, most of Europe right now. And so that will then go in 
where my cold weather clothes used to be, which like I'm wearing right now. Usually mm -hmm. this is in a duffel bag on the bike. I don't take it out right. unless it's cold. Yeah. So the other thing I, I often run into when I'm working is, is visas. Um, some countries make you get a visa, others don't. Um, but because I'm going from A, which is London, to B, which could be anywhere, um, I just usually have to worry about that one country. But if you're going on a long distance trip with a motorcycle, you must have to go through a lot of visa pro problems. Yeah, the visa for me is not the big challenge because I'm a US citizen and me, that's one of the best uh, passports you can have for travel because mm -hmm. you can go almost anywhere and the, the visa on arrival program is in place mm -hmm. for most countries. You just show up, you get a visa, and if they don't have that, you can get it online and you mm -hmm. show up with a printout. Um, there are exceptions to that, um, you know, China and Iran and, and so, places like that. You've got you've to plan ahead. The difficult thing is getting the motorcycle right. into the countries. And so, so tell me a little bit about how you get it from, say, from Tanzania to Kenya, for instance. So I've, the, the, uh, from Tanzania to Kenya, I have a carne. So a carne is a document that's sort of a passport for a vehicle or okay. goods. And if you're traveling with a lot of expensive gear, you need a carne for that gear. Right. Okay. If you're a professional film crew, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, that's the planning that I was doing. So for Africa, I did all of the paperwork and the planning in um, South America. So when I was in Buenos Aires, I was there for about six weeks mm -hmm. um, because I had to get the carne had to get it approved, had to have it uh, d delivered, I had to make sure that all my visas were in order, do all the research, right. and then once I got there, then it was just a matter of, of getting across the borders. So it didn't present a problem that you were applying for these carnets in a country that wasn't your home? Right, well, it's not, a, it's expensive. So I had to apply um, to the agency in the United States, Okay. and then they, I had to FedEx and courier all of my paperwork. And I have a friend, Craig Bolton, who I have a huge thank you to. Craig, if you're watching this, he uh, supervises a mailbox for me in, oh, in Arizona. Okay. Fantastic. And so what he does and, and other friends, what, I'll send them documents and then they will, will forward them on. Okay. And so without friends, certainly I couldn't do it. But then, yeah, the stuff has to then be FedExed or couriered mm -hmm. back to wherever I am. In fact, right now my carne is at Heathrow Airport with mm -hmm. a shipping agent, but they're really expensive. So they've got an $8,000 document. That right, I'm, wow. Um, but you get some of that back, correct? You get 80% of that back, assuming that you haven't broken any laws or, okay. or done anything. So it's, it's pretty expensive and any changes to the carne. So I need to add Asia and Australia in the future right. okay. just to make those changes. It's nearly a thousand dollars that you don't get back. Wow. So after all that uh, travel through all those continents, you must have a few anecdotes that you might want to you know, uh, share with our audience here. Some that I can actually tell. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of, um, First of all, the uh, question a lot of people ask me is, what's your favorite place? Where, okay. where, what's your favorite place? And for me, it's not much about the place as much as it is the people. Mm -hmm. And so really anywhere you go, there are people that are really enjoyable. But if I had to choose, mm -hmm. Colombia is at the top of the list. Right. I love Colombia. I love Mexico. Mm -hmm. Latin America really is, is great. Yeah, but um, I really, really, really loved Colombia. I loved South, America, or South Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, Cape Town has its own vibe, and then Joe Berg and Pretoria, those guys have their own vibe, which I really enjoyed, and then Australia. So those are really at the top of my list. Top of your list. Yeah. I kind of think, I think for me, when someone asks me that question, I just say, where am I going to next? Because yeah, exactly. I, don't, I don't really know. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say I've got one favorite country. There's lots of countries I like, places I like, um, but I, can't, I don't think I can put my finger on to say this is my actual favorite. It's all um, about the experience. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, like I, what happened when yeah. you were there. And I'm a little bit, uh, I've always got the itchy feet. You know, I always want to go to the next place. Yeah, me too. Constantly, constantly, constantly. Just when I, get, when I get back from a job, all I want to do is process a picture, send them in, and go somewhere else. That's sort of always on the <laughs> foreground of the my thing. mind. So just get on with it, keep going. Yeah. And it's like, like Mark says, it's, it's about the people. You know, it's, it's about, yeah. yes, the scenery's great, the, the histories are great, the, you know, the, maybe the, the architecture's fantastic, but it boils down to what the people are like. Yeah, and I'll tell you a story. So this is a, a normal experience for me. Um, I was in Panama, and I was going to take a ship, a boat from uh, this little town in Panama down to Cartagena, but it wasn't leaving for a couple of days. And so I was riding from the uh, eastern side of Panama to the western side. 
and I didn't have a hotel. I had nowhere to stay. Um, and so what I wanted to do was get a hotel. So I ride across the country. It's like an hour. Uh, I find the Starbucks. It's brand new in this little place. But I have my bike and I have all of my stuff on it. And so I have to park where I can physically see the bike. Of course. Because it'll be at risk of, of being stolen. And so I'm zipping around the parking lot and I can't find a place. And I see this guy and he has on a uh, sort of this um, apron, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he's working with some concrete. These guys are working in concrete. It's a brand new place. So I thought he's a construction worker. And uh, he, he waves me over and says, like, come on, you can park right here. And as I get closer, I realize that there's another BMW motorcycle, brand new, 2016, this is last year, and it's exactly the same as mine. And so right. in Panama, it's really rare. So I parked, and he said, wow, you have a motorcycle just like my motorcycle. I'm like, <laughs> this is your motorcycle? He's like, yeah, it's the only one in all of, uh, uh, of Panama. I'm wow. like, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, I'm hot, I'm sweaty. The guy says, well, you look hot and sweaty. Why don't you come down to the restaurant? I'm the chef there. And I realized he's not a construction worker. He's a chef. Oh, wow. So we walk down, and this is like a Michelin five-star place. And I'm like, I, I shouldn't be in here because I'm hot and sweaty and smelly. And as soon as we walk in, the whole place snaps to attention because the chef is there. And I realize he's not just the chef. He's the owner oh, of this wow. place. Right. And I get served like a five-star meal for free. Because wow. he's a fellow overland traveler. We started talking. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're making plans to do some trips. We become friends, and we've been friends ever since. Wow. And so uh, we're planning a trip to Australia. But that happens all the time where mm -hmm. you're just thinking, I just need to get to a hotel. The next thing you know, you have a friend for life. Wow. Over and over and over again. Wow. Not quite the same with me. <laughs> <laughs> because I go in hard and fast, and I'm on a limited amount of time, and I'm usually working 18, 20 hour days because of the, the briefs are so specific. Um, I make fast fleeting friendships that last about three or four minutes so I can get the images. Um, I don't have the luxury of, of, of waiting around to, to talk to the chef or talk to the, the local person. Um, it's very rare that I get that chance it's because I'm on such a tight schedule usually. Um, I need just to get the pictures. I need to fulfill my brief and that's the foremost thing in my mind the whole time. Yes, I want to talk to the people. Yes, it's great when they're, they're, they're uh, accommodating. Um, but unfortunately, uh, with the way I work, it's not always that easy to get, to have that time to really make a connection with a local person, which is a little bit disappointing. Join us for more on this fascinating travel discussion between Mark and Doug. In part two, Doug and Mark talk about their scary wildlife encounters and include their must-have gear for travel photography.